I would like to talk about genetic algorithms. They were uh, particularly useful for me during my PhD. And I think in terms of being able to build something yourself and experiment with them, I think they're quite good bang for buck. And I think you can solve a lot of problems using them, which you would otherwise be able to do so. And even if you can't solve them perfectly, you get an indication of what's what. And I think that's pretty neat. And there's a broader category called evolutionary algorithms, and this is a particular type of them. If you represent a problem in a uh, specific way, you can evolve solutions to that problem in a way which mimics biological evolution. And it's quite visual as well. Where we start is we have to have a suitable problem in order to, uh, in order to be applied to genetic algorithm. Um, some problems are more suitable than others. And we're going to do a toy problem for this called the knapsack problem. You have a knapsack, which is like a rucksack or a bergen, and you fill it with boxes. And each box has a weight and a value. And the objective is to fill the bergen with the most value without going over a specified weight limit. So a good way to think about the knapsack problem is an Aladdin's cave full of treasure. So if you're in the desert and you had one rucksack, you'd have to fill it with the most valuable items. And that's a very good representation of, of this exact problem. We're gonna do a simple version of the knapsack problem just because it's um, easy to understand. So we're gonna have four boxes and each one has a weight. And then we'll write the values below it, which again will be just made up. So if we do, Five, four, seven, two. So these are our four boxes. And we've got a Bergen here. And the goal is to put the maximum value of boxes in this Bergen without going over a weight limit. So seeing as these are the weight limits, we're gonna impose a limit of 15 kilograms. So if the limit is 15, what we put into the Bergen or the knapsack has got to be less than 15 we can actually represent a solution to this problem with four bits. So four either zeros or ones, and each one corresponding to a box. And this one's pointing to this box. What this says is that the first box, this one, won't be included in the knapsack. The second one will, the third one will, and the fourth one won't. And what we can do is then we can add up the values and the weights to see how well this satisfies this problem. So the weights are two and one, so that's three and three is less than 15 kilograms. So what we can do is then we can give it a score on the value. So we can actually return the score, which is four plus seven, which is 11. So this solution here scores 11. Now, if we were gonna do one which is perhaps not so successful, so we can do one, one, zero, one, this solution has these two boxes in, and these two boxes are quite heavy. So what we know, with the limit being 15, if we add nine and seven, that's 16, which is above the limit. So what this solution returns is zero. So this is a useless solution, we don't want it. And the goal is, is to get, over time, the best combination of boxes so that we can get the most value um, without being overweight. So now we know how to represent our solutions. What we can do is we can make a population of solutions, which for now will just be random. So we got no idea how well they're gonna score. So this is our population that we've got to start with. So this is eight randomly generated solutions. So what we did previously when we defined the problem, that's a fitness function. So if we were gonna write that into code, what would happen is we would be able to give it one of these solutions and it would return how good that solution is. So what we can do is we can go through each one of these and we can get a score to say how fit this solution is. We can put the scores here. So let's just, have a little table. So basically they get the score of the value, but if the weight's too high, they get a zero. So exactly right. Yep, that's it. So we've now got our scores. So we've got an idea of how good these solutions are. It's similar to survival of the fittest. So in general with this algorithm, the better solutions tend to survive and propagate over time. What we do now is once we've got our population and we've got the fitnesses of that population, we do something called selection. We have to select some of the population to go forward to the next step. And there are many ways we can do this. Um, one of the ways which is quite common is something called roulette wheel selection, where each one of these solutions will get a chunk of a, an artificial roulette wheel, and the bigger the score, the bigger the chunk, and we spin it. Generally, if you have a high score, it's like you've got a bigger chunk and you're more likely to be selected. However, that's not always the case. We'll do a different one, which is objectively quite good, and um, it's easier to implement, and that's called tournament selection. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a mini tournament and we're gonna randomly select two members of the population, two solutions, to have a little battle. And the one with the highest score wins. These are just picked randomly. So we're gonna pick this solution and this one for the first tournament, okay? And the winner of this tournament 
is this one. So the best score here for this tournament was top one, so that's six. And then we're going to have another tournament between, say, this one and this one. So these two have a little battle, and it's this one that wins. We've now got our two parents, which we will draw here. So they were the lucky winners of the tournaments. So we've got zero, one, zero, one. For the other parent, we've got zero, zero, one, one. So then what we can do is we can do something called crossover, which is when we cross over some information from parent A with some information from parent B. And we're gonna do this by basically splitting in half and just swapping each part over. So the idea of this is that then we get two children which have a little bit of parent A and a little bit of parent B. And when we're using a, a genetic algorithm, we do this according to a, to a rate. So we can set a parameter at the start called the crossover rate. A lot of playing with genetic algorithms is, is changing the, the rates and population size. So yes, we're gonna swap over our two parents to create two children. So we're gonna do the first two, so the first one, and the last two. And then, so then we will have two children now, and we'll draw them down here. So the first one, zero, one from here, and then one, one from this parent. And then we'll have zero, zero from this one, and then zero, one from up here. So these are our two children. So we've done crossover to get the children. So now we've got one final um, operator to do, and that's mutation. So we also have a mutation rate as well as a crossover rate. And a mutation rate is typically a lot lower than the um, crossover rate. Um, so typically something like 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, something like that. And what we do is we loop over every bit of information that we've got in the two children. And for each one of these, we pull a random number between zero and one. If it's less than the mutation rate, we flip a bit. Okay, so this mimics um, mutation in nature. The idea that sometimes you can just get random unexpected changes, which adds the variance to the population, which over time is quite useful. So what we're going to do is we are going to flip just this bit. So now this child is now that. And what we started off with, we had our population. We went through tournament selection. We had a little mini tournament. We got two parents. We then crossed the parents over. In this instance, that doesn't always happen, but it did here. And then we've gone through mutation and mutation has flipped one of the bits from a one to a zero. So these are now our two completed children. Once we have our children here, what we do is we repeat this process until we get an equivalent amount of children that were in our original population. So what we do is we go back to this stage and we've already calculated the fitnesses of every single member of the population. So what we do is we just generate another random tournament. So it won't be this one and this one, or it could be, but it will likely be a, a different tournament. So we could do this one and this one for the first tournament, and then say this one and this one for the second tournament. And then we would generate another two children, and then we go back and do the genetic operation on those two children. And then if we've done that twice, we'll have four children. So we'd repeat that process until we have the same amount of children as we had in the population. And then once we've swapped over the population of children that we've created with the old population, that's one generation, okay? And typically what we do is you run this for 100, 250, 500,000 generations. And over time, what you should see is the average fitness um, of the population gets much better and the best fitness gets a lot better. And generally what you see is you see a curve that goes up and then it tapers off at the end. And that's generally a good time to stop the algorithm. I'm guessing this is normally done with a lot more parameters than four, right? Yes, so you're exactly right. This problem is trivial. It's more interesting if you add other parameters. So if instead of having weight and value, you could have weight, value and size. Or um, additionally, you can have something like weight, value and um, robustness. So if it's like an Aladdin's cave full of jewellery, um, you'd want to take the ones that are lowest in weight, highest in value. But if two were the same in that respect, you'd probably elect to take a piece of gold rather than a china pot because it might break in your rucksack. So when you start having more parameters, it becomes less easy for, to see what exactly is a good solution to this problem. And indeed how good um, a given box is. Because if some parameters are really high and some are really low, you don't quite know where it exists. And when you start having a hundred, a thousand of these, this is when, um, Jake Aaron's can be quite useful. They sometimes don't give you the optimum solution. Um, in fact, they often don't, but they give you a good idea of what direction it's going in. 
um, so you can get a, a better grasp of the problem at hand. This is a very vanilla genetic algorithm and there are some things that could be improved. And one of them is that if we look at this sheet here, this was our original population where we had scores. This solution here wasn't picked even though it was the highest. So it was just randomly not picked in this instance. But hypothetically, it is possible for this solution not to be picked at all and not to not be passed to the next generation. So there are some strategies which you can use to overcome this. One of them is elitism, which is where you basically take the best solution from the population and then you put it in the next generation anyway. So you just remove one from the, the new eight that we had, the new population, and then just put that one in here. If we were going to use this legitimately to solve this problem, there are some parameters in here which would be better if they were changed. So for example, the population size eight is good visually, but generally, if we're going to start out using genetic algorithms, we use a population size of something like 100, 250, 1000, something like that. Because with this, it's very hard to get variation, partly because we've only got eight solutions, but partly because the, the problem's so simple. So if we did have value, weight, and then we had size, because some shapes are better than others, and robustness, and then we had 100 boxes. I'd probably start with a population size of 500, and I'd have a crossover rate of 0 0.5, so crossover happens half the time, and probably a mutation rate of 0 0.05. And I'd use a tournament selection, because it's very rare you have a tournament selection size two. It's not particularly useful. I'd have a tournament selection of something like four or eight. Those parameters just loosely should help um, preserve the heterogeneity within the population to make sure that you have a, a, um, a rich space to look through. Because ultimately, this is a search algorithm. This is just going through this search space here to try and find the best solution. And if you solve other functions, you can actually plot how the genetic algorithm is moving through a specific function have to work out whether it's worth alerting the user if you find the key. So you know, you download the temporary exposure key, you perform the, the encryption, you generate the potential RPIs and you compare them with the ones you've seen. And if or if you want a more slightly comprehensible message, it's saying maybe you haven't applied a function to enough arguments.